Let me use this. That's better. Thanks, Josh, and thanks to Schneff's Media for having us. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so you heard from Rudy Winter, who's our New York uh, president earlier. I'll stop just giving you a little bit more wider context on National Grid. So as you heard from Rudy, here in Brooklyn, we operate the, uh, the gas networks. But if you take the state of New York as a whole, we're a very large electric network uh, as well as gas. We also operate electric and gas networks in Massachusetts, and we operate on the other side of the Atlantic, and we're almost entirely an electric business on the other side of the Atlantic. Overall, we're 70% electric and 30% gas across the whole of our business. We define ourselves, we position ourselves as the energy transition company. That's what we see we're here for, is to deliver the energy transition. And we are working through, at the moment, all our different business units, uh, and then for the whole business, to get science-based targets, 1.5 degrees Celsius accredited, so that our business is fully compliant with, uh, with the um, global climate goals. So when we think about our gas business here in, in Brooklyn, um, we think about it from that context. How do we play our part? How do we decarbonize? Now, Rudy gave us a great outline of our fossil-free gas plan. Uh, and he talked about four elements to that. Energy efficiency, massive role to play. Uh, Fossil-free gas, so converting from natural gas to fossil-free gas. Uh, the hybrid solution. Heat pumps are a great solution in many circumstances, but in many cases, actually keeping the gas, now fossil-free, to boost the heat pump when the weather is really cold um, is going to be a really good option. And then finally, targeted electrification. For some customers, electrification will be a good option. Might be air source heat pumps, might be ground source heat pumps, i.e. geothermal. I want to talk a little bit more about the fossil-free gas. So we've heard from the panel some of the challenges and issues. Hydrogen will take time. It's a great end destination, but it will take a little bit of time. So in the early stages, the transition will be more focused on renewable natural gas. So again, to reiterate what Rudy said, agricultural waste, food waste, landfill, Wastewater treatment plants, there are thousands of these installations all over the United States, and they produce methane, which goes to the atmosphere. That is a very potent greenhouse gas. We will capture that, and we'll put it into the gas networks and use it as a fuel. That is carbon neutral, or even potentially carbon negative, if you're swapping CO2 emissions for, for methane emissions. Where are we going to get it from? Well, we'll address the same catchment area we use for natural gas today. The natural gas here in the system is not produced in New York. It comes through interstate pipelines, and there's a wide catchment area that it comes from. Uh, if we look at the same catchment area, we look at the potential for renewable natural gas in that catchment area, we need about the same market share that we have today of natural gas. 15 to 20 percent of that resource potential will allow us to deliver our vision, will allow us to deliver that transition for renewable natural gas. So this is a proven technology, the resource base is there, this can be done. On the green hydrogen side, that is a very exciting end destination. So renewable power, electrolysis of water, produces hydrogen and oxygen, you split the water. Oxygen to atmosphere, that's a good thing, and the hydrogen into the, into the gas networks. Uh, that's what we'll do. Uh, where will we get it from? We'll get it, by and large, from offshore wind uh, in this state. And we are walking the walk as well as talking the talk here. We have partnered with RWE. We are in Community Offshore Wind, which has just acquired the largest offshore wind lease in New York Bight, capable of many gigawatts of offshore wind that can provide many millions of homes with power. In the middle of the night, there is no market for that offshore wind. Once we get above 20 gigawatts or so of offshore wind uh, in New York, we are going to need green hydrogen to make the economics of those renewables work. If you're planning a marge and the next wind farm, uh, when we're in that situation, you're going to be looking at yourself constrained off or getting a very low price off peak. So you, need another, you need another revenue stream for that. That is green hydrogen. We will buy the power off peak. We will make green hydrogen and we will blend it into the gas networks. It's really turning the gas network into a giant battery for renewable energy, the world's biggest battery. That's where we'll get the green hydrogen from. If we compare an all-electric scenario with this hybrid scenario where we've got fossil-free gas and electric, we need less generation. Whether that's gas, whether that's renewables, we need less generation 
in the hybrid scenario. That's because if you electrify everything, because of the storage problems, very difficult to store electricity for more than a few hours, right? Batteries give you a few hours. You need to overbuild. You need to significantly overbuild the system. If you're using it via hydrogen, you've got that world's largest battery, gives you the storage you don't need to overbuild. So that's, that's how we'll do the, the fossil-free gas. That is a sensible plan for us, for our networks, because it allows our networks to transition, allows us to stay in business in a zero carbon world. But it is also a very good plan for New York. Why is that? A full electrification is hard with renewable power because of the storage issue. And this is usually a light bulb moment for, for people who are not aware of this. The heat system is massive in energy terms. The, the gas networks deliver at peak three times as much energy as the electric networks. So if you're gonna transfer all that energy from the gas network, which is underground, fully reliable, built-in storage, if you're gonna transfer all that energy onto the electric network, you have to massively expand and reinforce the electric network. You have to massively either overbuild the generation or build lots of probably hydrogen storage to get you to do it, or both. So you make a very difficult problem two or three times as large if you don't go down that, that hybrid route. So you avoid those very significant system scale challenges. For the householder, it's about choice, as we've heard from multiple uh, speakers today. We are not gonna make anyone do anything. If you wanna go fully electric, you can. And in many cases, that will be a good option. But if you can't afford a heat pump, or you can't afford the impact on bills, or you're not ready to replace your appliances, or your house is not, you know, we've heard multi-occupancy residences is not conducive to that, this gives you another option. So it's about choice, it's about avoiding increased costs on communities who are, find it hardest to bear. What do we need to make this transition go as smoothly as possible? Some targets would be good, a performance standard on the gas networks to require us to start blending in uh, RNG and increasingly in the future green hydrogen. That would help make us, put, make us walk the walk as well as talk the talk. That would be something that we would be looking for. We've heard about training plumbers and gas fitters. Uh, I think on the appliance side, we could also do with starting to think ahead. If we said within the next few years, you know what, from let's say 2027, within the next five years, all gas appliances have to be hydrogen ready, have to be capable of conversion to burning hydrogen. Then by the time we go through the blend wall, by the time we get above 20% hydrogen in the gas networks in say the mid to late 2030s, the vast majority of the appliance stock in place by then will be easily convertible. What does hydrogen ready mean? They're looking at this in other places around the world. A typical definition would be no more than one hour in the household to convert the appliance and no more than 10 to 20% of the original appliance cost to do the conversion. And that cost could be socialized through the rate base, doesn't necessarily have to be recovered directly from the customer. If we did that, that conversion is a lot easier, a lot cheaper, a lot more straightforward than having to remove your appliances and put in place uh, new appliances. That's if you can do it. As we heard from Rudy, 60% of the housing stock in New York City will struggle to be converted to electric heat. I think another point to make, if you draw a straight line from now to 2050 and look at how many uh, uh, conversions would have to be done every day from electric to gas, it is twice the natural appliance replacement rate. So if we went down the ele full electrification route, in 50% of cases, you'd be telling people to replace their appliances before they're ready, at cost, and then in a large number of situations, they would then have an inferior uh, experience once they've done that. If we had to do it, if it's the only way, that's what we would have to do because we need to meet the challenge of climate change, no question. So if it's the only way, that's what we would have to do. But this plan gives a choice. It gives another tool in the toolbox to enable us to make that transition. So once again, very pleased to be here. Great to support this event. We're excited about the vision that we have, the fossil free vision for New York City, and we look forward over the coming months and years to filling that out and going on that journey. Thank you very much.